Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. Um, although not all of us are here back yet, we, we will start because we do not want to be late. Uh, my name is Liana Gentz and I work for the International Step-by-Step -Step Association, ISA. And let me just say again how pleased we are to be co-hosting this event and to co-host you here in Prague. Uh, I have now the honor to introduce um, the, next, um, the moderator of the next panel, um, Andy Shi, who comes from the uh, organization called Autism Speak where he is um, Vice President for Scientific Affairs. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. Appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, to, facilitate, to facilitate this particular session. Uh, as you know, this session is called Children with Developmental Delay, Disabilities, and Atypical Developing, uh, developing Children. Uh, the objective is really to explore Global efforts to identify and provide services to young children with disabilities and developmental delays and those developing atypically. The session will include discussion on early childhood intervention available throughout Europe and our emphasis on, on, the, on policy. Um, before we start, I just want to say that um, we're going to have this session going to be in two parts as the other session. First, we're going to have three distinguished speakers um, to share with us their, uh, their work as well as their insight. And then we'll bring up uh, the reaction panel. Uh, there'll be five of them uh, from regional countries uh, to uh, react to the, the presentation that's been made. Um, I have a, a, a special place in my heart for Southeast Europe. Albania is actually the first country that Often Speaks uh, work with internationally. And um, we're obviously uh, honored today to have the former First Lady, um, Dr. Lyria Berisha, with us as part of the reaction panel. But as, as a result of the work in, in Albania, and with the support of the Albanian Ministry of Health, we actually formed a regional network uh, modeled after the South European Health Network of the WHO. It's called the South European Autism Network. And <clears throat> it involves currently nine countries in the region, Albania, Macedonia, Croatia, and so on. And they each have a, uh, a, a co national coordinator appointed by the Ministry of Health. And we get together every year to talk about common challenges and try to uh, share experiences and, and work together on a collaborative project. And um, the reason I say all this is actually um, some of you may have this um, information in your packet. Um, the project we've been working on as a network is, uh, is called the Caregiver Needs Network, or oh, survey, sorry. And, uh, and the reason we did this is because um, I feel that the voice has been missing in the discussion has been the voice of the families, the voice of the parents. Uh, we want to better understand the experience that they, they go through trying to negotiate and navigate the system and try to get the support they need for their children. And having this, um, uh, that perspective on the families, I think will be important for us as we think about how we can develop programs and solutions uh, for this particular population. Uh, I'd also like to say that, you know, the fact that the Sean Network exists, uh, so, so there's actually a preliminary report from data from five regional countries uh, that is in your, in your packet. And, um, the, we actually have additional uh, member joining the network, even though it's currently on server status, is Turkey, and they actually uh, contribute a number of uh, data to this particular survey. So I think all this activity is, uh, I like to think of it as a demonstration of greater awareness by the policymaker of the disability issue, but certainly greater political will, I think even among, even among the administrations in the region. Um, of course, there's much more work to remain. I mean, example of this is that we, you know, I travel with some, some of these countries that have beautiful inclusive education laws on the, on the books. And, uh, and you look at them and they're everything which they're supposed to be. But when you actually get on the ground, you find that you know, a, a kid with development disability like autism in the school, first time they have a, a behavioral tantrum, they're told to go home, not to come back. So implementation remains a major issue, uh, even when there are well-intentioned laws on the table. And <clears throat> I think it's also important to think about individuals and children with autism, because even though there's a, a sort of ongoing discussion on political correctness in terms of what you call them, we prefer to call them children with autism, because we see them as children first. Their disability does not define them. And also, I think the important thing is that children with disability, they need the same level of support as any other kid, typically developing kids. So, we should try to make an effort, trying to integrate them, to include them into, into our existing system as much as possible. 
especially in the context of SDG, I think the inclusion of these children in health, education, and social protection system is certainly a priority. But also, I think, in research and ECD policy making, because so far they've been separated, right? And I think we should try to think about is there an opportunity for just for us to bring these two sectors together so that there could be an inclusion in life for all these children and they should be a priority. Um, so with that, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, three distinguished experts with us today. Uh, first up is going to be uh, Dr. Viva, Viva Krishnamurthy. Oh, sorry, Don, sorry. <laughs> It'll be Don Worland, uh, who is from the Partnership for Early Childhood Development and Disability Right. Don. Thank you, Andy, and thank you uh, to the forum for including me in this session. Uh, uh, as I begin, let me just share three dilemmas thus far from the morning that uh, we might think together about, and if you can help me solve them, I appreciate it. Uh, my interest includes connecting the dots between the CRC and the CRPD. So what the Convention on Rights of Children says a little bit about children with disabilities, the CRPD says a little bit about children. So the kind of uh, handout and chart that we had from Professor Todres, which talks about the CRC and its contributions, to see another column there with the CRPD and the power, if the forum was looking for a project to take on, It'd be a great project. Uh, I'm also a little concerned about this misleading notion of margins. If the population sizes that we've been talking about, and I'm now going to talk about children with disabilities, which depending on what you believe or how it gets counted, maybe it's 5% of a country's population, uh, it's as much as 40% in some surveys. I think we're safe saying it's 20% around there. But that's a pretty big margin. And if we add to that the other factors, uh, it's there. And then the third is, uh, how do I feel as a, an advocate for children with disabilities about being on the laundry list? So the laundry list is we say children at the margins are vulnerable children, girls, Roma, emergency zone, conflict zone, disabled. Uh, what do I gain and what do I lose by being on that laundry list? Uh, there seems to be some notion among us that we're at a momentous moment, at a kind of tipping point. After all, we have a quarter century with the CRC and the CRPD. Uh, we have the SDGs and the Incheon Declaration on Inclusive and Equitable Education for All. We have each of the agencies, each of the multilaterals over the past two or three years issuing major reports on uh, matters of children with disabilities. Uh, the European Agency has announced its follow-up of early childhood intervention to be termed inclusive early childhood development. And soon we'll hear from Holly on the uh, recent survey of global ECI policies. Uh, in the United States, we have a brand new policy on including children with disabilities in early childhood programs. Uh, UNICEF is about to release its inclusive early childhood development uh, guidance and UNESCO has launched e-learning for inclusive society that uh, includes a 0 to 3 module and a 4 to 16 module. So we have lots going on. You have the reports. Some of them are familiar here. Uh, and uh, a flood of information on early childhood development uh, that provides strong and urgent case for action and investment in the needs and rights of children with disabilities. In particular, uh, uh, I'm pleased to see that uh, there are several members of our task force, Early Childhood Development Task Force of the Global Partnership for Children with Disabilities that are explicitly articulating the case for children with disabilities within the ECD uh, framework. And uh, we draw upon that uh, both for science and for policy. No doubt your bookshelves are flush with these recent policy and program documents. There are four transformative trends that we see at work here, uh, and they include growing numbers of uh, children living with disabilities. Uh, that's a crucial one in terms of numbers and complexity. These children uh, generally comprise at least 5% or as much as 25% of any country's population. 
Uh, they require and they deserve inclusion in global efforts to build healthy and prosperous societies. For the first time in over 35 years, uh, the State of the World's Children Report out of UNICEF uh, just two years ago uh, only then gives priority to children with disabilities, a number they gave at 93 million children across the globe. Uh, back in 1980, with the launch of the State of the World's Children, uh, they were included in this laundry list of vulnerable groups, and that group was estimated at 150 million children. Uh, so refinements of definition, epidemiology, and measurement remain crucial challenges, but have not and need not stop progress towards inclusive early childhood development. Uh, we've alluded already that we're dealing with a new morbidity. Uh, I'm all for celebrating progress in child survival, but let's acknowledge and act on the needs of the survivors. We have more children living with more disability. Uh, essentially, this is the price of development. As the global community achieves its worthy goals in reducing infant mortality, more babies live, many of them with disabilities that threaten to compromise their current and eventual health and functioning. As technological, economic, and social advances globalize, the cost in terms of disability rises. Treatments for what were terminal illnesses become accessible to more communities. Greater numbers of children survive, often with chronic illness and disability. New highways, faster cars, more road crashes, more injuries, more mortality and morbidity. The, the diseases of affluence, obesity, cardiovascular, behavioral illnesses have both early childhood origins and lifelong effects. We remain in need of greater appreciation, and uh, uh, Dr. Vesta's comment about unintended consequences needs to be underlined and echoed in each of the discussions. Modernization and economic prosperity bring with them a new and challenging array of health parameters. Uh, more postpartum disorder showing up with modernization, and we know that that will translate into more need for early intervention, more disability. Uh, we've shifted away from medical models to biopsychosociocultural models, so some reference to that, and away from narrow deficit models to strength-based models. And Viva is going to illustrate in just a moment some uh, examples of that. And certainly the rights-based framework that replaces the old charity-based approach is quite important. Less focus on handouts, more attention to hand-ups, cultivating human capital, investing for a stronger and more prosperous society. So if I can be so provocative uh, to assert that there are two necessary but not sufficient conditions for progress towards the SDGs, uh, first one we've heard about over and over is the cross-sectoral integration, collaboration, and interoperability. And uh, I won't go into that more because uh, there seems to be some consensus that it has to be done how to do it uh, remains to be seen. Uh, the second is what I'll call triple twin tracking. I think many of us are familiar with uh, twin tracking because it's been considered the mainstreaming of disability, and I'll call that twin track one. So we have here the notion of cultivating inclusive services, but also knowing that in many countries, uh, capacity for special services must be developed simultaneously in order for inclusive services to work. Uh, I, I'm cautious around the word mainstreaming because in the United States, to the extent that that's a good example, uh, mainstreaming is a very 20th century idea, and inclusion is its 21st century uh, version, uh, but there are some, uh, some issues with that language. Uh, there's another twin track that's extremely important, and that's uh, child and family-centered as well as community-based, and Viva's comments will address that. And similarly, our special knowledge of young children uh, as well as uh, older children uh, becomes important to distinguish. Uh, so we have disability services as part of universal services in track one. We have twin track two, which uh, promotes child and family as well as community-based services, and twin track three, which puts those things together into a kind of three-legged stool, uh, a lot of harmony in a high-conflict zone, you might uh, consider. The challenges, the opportunities, as I finish up here, are the tyranny of tradition, clinging to outmoded medical deficit models and narrow limited frameworks of defectology, rehabilitation, and special education, leave us siloed, leave us fragmented, 
large NGO organizations and funding organizations that can be quite influential in defining priorities for uh, uh, decreasing childhood mortality emphasis and looking more at developmental outcomes of survivors, essentially what are called the new frontiers of uh, development. Uh, there's the tyranny of special in terms of nomenclature and epidemiology. Uh, we call uh, on policymakers to increase the knowledge base uh, because uh, too often, uh, for a variety of reasons, these children are excluded from studies. We ask scientists and funders to commit to new generation of research that reflects an inclusive early childhood development and rejects the exclusion and marginalization of disability matters in the name of rigor or expediency. For instance, a seminal review of research on parenting and supporting and strengthening child caregiver relationships lists as exclusion criteria papers focused on specific pathologies, rare and uncommon illnesses, disorders or disabilities, such as attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. And uh, we see this kind of uh, scientific rigor uh, presented as expediency and uh, essentially yet another reason for excluding. Uh, so uh, to move us into the, the next task and to consider this bit of wisdom, to err is human, to forgive divine, uh, we're faced with the issue to screen, to diagnose, to single track rather than twin track, to exclude, these are all quite human factors, uh, but to intervene for good, to include, to invest early, to invest smart, and invest for all, that becomes the divine goal. So I'll ask Viva to elaborate on some elements of this, and then we'll hear from Holly on some findings from the ECI survey. Thank you, Don. Uh, for the next speaker is Dr. Viva Krishna Murthy. Uh, she's the founder and director of uh, Imid uh, Child uh, Development Center in India. Thank you, Andy, and I will try to uh, thank you. I will try to take off where uh, Don left off, and what I'm going to do is try to uh, do what Sarah said this morning, which is integrate science in ways that are practical and useful, particularly with reference to policy and practice. And I will try to use examples from my own practice at our center in Omid in Mumbai to illustrate that. One thing that Don talked about was. Uh, moving from a medical to biopsychosocial model. In this audience, I don't need to tell anyone the difference between the photograph on the left and the photograph on the right. On the right is one of my little patients with Down syndrome. Uh, he comes to our early intervention center. His family is a middle class family in Mumbai, and he gets services at our center. On the left is a little boy who I met in a village in India. And he actually is brought up by his 12-year-old sister while his mother works in the fields. He has an 80% chance of being anemic and a 1 in 2 chance of being malnourished. He also has a care provider who on a daily basis, or a caregiver on a daily basis, has no idea about the importance of communication and play in his development. When we look at this continuum, we see that the needs of both the children are not that different. And the outcomes are going to vary depending upon the multiple factors that contribute to their development. When we place disability as a special issue that our communities and care providers need to deal with, they seem a little overwhelmed by this special population they need to take care of. But if you place it in the context of the needs not being that different, in terms of both benefiting from better outcomes if they're identified early and get early intervention, then the task doesn't seem so daunting. So what does this mean for twin, twin track one? What this really means is that when we are planning community health programs or we are planning intervention programs, really placing children with disabilities in the context of child development in general is really useful. So, for example, at our center at Umid, we have five programs running which are focused on rural and urban poor, and they're looking at early childhood development and disability. You'll notice that the child is the, the title says ECDD, and that's deliberate. We include disability in the title and put it right out there because when we talk about early childhood development, we cannot talk about disability outside that context. We need to place it squarely in that context. What does it mean for the training program itself? We begin the training program by 
teaching the focus on promoting ECD in families in the community and talking about the importance of ECD in general. We then layer that with monitoring for early childhood development in the form of detecting children with delays and disabilities early. Third, we layer that with working closely with families to provide services to children at risk or children with disabilities. And yes, sure, these children do need specialized services. There may be kids who need hearing, hearing tests. There may be kids who need wheelchairs. And to make sure we do that, we identify local resources along with our community resources and try to provide capacity for those local resources to provide specialized services. I'm moving now to the second issue that we spoke about, moving from a deficit to a strengths-based approach. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Jamil Poverty Action Lab in MIT. I was struck by this quote from the book, which is actually the essence of the book by Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, which is that the way the poor make decisions is not that different from the way you and I make decisions. It's just that they have fewer choices and they're very well aware of the fact that their decisions are even more important, the choices they make. I want to tell you the story of this little boy to illustrate what I'm saying. I have their permission to use this story. In fact, they urged me to use their story when I, when I asked them permission. So at the center of this, you see a little boy, Amol. He's 10 years old. I could tell his story in two different ways. I could tell you about a little boy who was diagnosed late with hypothyroidism at the age of 10 months. He received thyroxine too late and then ended up having intellectual disability. And that's who I see before me. And I could end the story right there. But then that would be missing out on the rest of the story. I will now tell you the story of a family who comes from the, one of the poorest districts in my state. They went from pillar to post when they realized their one month old was not doing well. He was sluggish and he was not developing and he was, his cry was hoarse. He was a little jaundiced. They didn't know what was going on. They finally got their diagnosis with the eighth doctor they visited when he was 10, month old, 10 months old. He was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. At one and a half to two years, they noticed that their baby was not speaking like the other kids. And so then they sought help and finally showed up at our center, which is a 12-hour bumpy bus ride away from their community. The story doesn't end there. This family actually has mobilized resources from their local government agency to get funding for this child to go to their local school. They have mobilized others in their community, and now they refer patients to me. Right? So, so this is the story of a family whose strengths we used. And on the left, you will see two of our community workers working with children and with families. But on the right, you will see a self-help group where we make ECD and disability a priority for the community. They take ownership of what we're talking about. I'm going to pause here for a second and talk about the fact that I come from a context, as do most of you, um, where the social discourse is about the importance of the expert. It took a long time for me to unlearn this, and it was not easy. I was fortunate enough to get two structured teaching sessions, two types of teaching to help me unlearn this. And if it's not easy for me, it's certainly not easy for the community health workers, the teachers, the therapists, and the doctors we teach in that increasing order of difficulty in terms of teaching them. It is very difficult to recognize families as the experts in their own lives, and not just the experts in their own lives, but in terms of the people who are ultimately going to make a difference in their own communities. So I just want to highlight that as something we need to keep in mind in terms of building capacity for low and middle income countries particularly, because this is not intuitive, it's certainly not taught, and most people have not experienced this. Lastly, I want to point out the importance of the third twin track. Yes, we do have ECD where all the sectors come together, but do we have inclusive schools and inclusive centers for young adults where we can then transition some of our children that we're talking about? We have specialized knowledge about what works for kids in early childhood education. Do we transfer what we know about kids with disability to that context? So in other words, what makes things better for the most vulnerable in your population will make things better for everyone. And that's something we need to remember. I will end with the recommendations that we've been 
are requested to provide. And this just summarizes what Don actually said. Um, firstly, the need to look beyond survival into the developmental outcomes of those who survive. The fact that to date, all our research points to, uh, in the area of ECD and ECE, tends to exclude children with disability. We need to stop consciously doing that. And that, of course, extends to policy across sectors. And lastly, and most importantly, I think we need to build capacity in low and middle income countries, and all countries indeed, for family-centered and strengths-based approaches, something for which we have no structured learning available today. Thank you. Thank you, Viva. <clears throat> Thank you, Viva. And uh, third, certainly not least, um, I have uh, Dr. Holly Hicks-Small, uh, assistant professor and uh, Portland State University and consultant, early childhood intervention. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be with you. So I'm going to talk about this um, global survey on early childhood intervention. And I want to just recognize Emily vargas Brown, who's in the room with us. Emily, maybe can wave your arm. Emily and I, thank you, had this great idea at some point um, when I was working actually for Open Society Foundation of seeing what the global state of early childhood intervention was like, and it turned into quite the endeavor. Um, but I'm going to talk about this today, and I do want to let you know that an executive summary and full report of the findings will be made available in 2016. So you won't see a lot of the data here, but it will be available shortly. So this was really a first exploratory study, um, and so it's not you know, rigorous. It really was meant to just um, take a look at what was happening globally. So it's a descriptive study, and we wanted to learn about the status of early childhood intervention and look at exploring some regional differences, some key dimensions, um, identify strengths and weaknesses as we could, and of course, to make some recommendations. I hope that this serves as a baseline and that it will facilitate um, communication. And so today as well, I will try and highlight some of the findings in um, this region um, as I go, and it is the region that I'm um, pretty familiar with. So it was a collaboration between Open Society Foundations and the International Society on Early Intervention with Mike Rolnick. And it was an online survey, but there were English and French uh, versions available in PDF and Word, which was very important for those countries that have unstable internet connection, that they could complete it offline and then give it to us. And most questions were answered uh, yes, no, or don't know. Um, there were qualitative questions. It was a seven-page questionnaire and 38 questions uh, in total looking at different components. So you can see here the key dimensions. We were looking at um, policy frameworks and regulations, um, whether there were child identification, uh, so screening and referral systems in place, assessment, uh, program planning, looking at whether there was any monitoring and evaluation going on, as well as uh, personnel pre- and in-service training and financial support for early intervention agencies. So an example question would be, um, the government has officially adopted a national policy that includes an early childhood intervention system, um, or a national screening and referral system has been established to identify children who may be eligible for ECI services. And I can make the questionnaire available to you if that's of interest. So I want to kind of point out what early childhood in intervention is. There's actually a lot of confusion. I hear the term early intervention a lot. But early childhood intervention is a field. And children in need of early intervention, you can see listed um, on the screen, it's not just children with identified disabilities. Um, it's malnourished children, children with developmental delays, um, children who are very at risk of um, developing delays. And early childhood intervention services are individualized. They are services that help families understand what they can do with their children within the daily routine. 
they're intensive and they're family-centered and based on a team of professionals that are working with the family collaboratively and they're informed by evidence we do have a, a quite a good body of research on what is and isn't effective in Eastern Europe early childhood intervention is absolutely critical for preventing institutionalization, so for family preservation, and then of course, if a family is placed back with their if their child is placed back with the um, biological family or foster family, it's important. I'm just going to move along because I have um, not much time. We know that the traditional approaches, really globally, um, have focused on deficits. Services have been fragmented, families excluded, and what I mean by that is um, children going to big rehabilitation centers and families sitting in the hallway. So the family is not aware of what they might be able to do with the child when the child is with them at the home. So um, services were excluded from natural settings like in um, schools or uh, in the home. And it really was a, a one size fits all. You know, you have um, diagnosis X, so you get X service. And we know that doesn't really work. And so we can see contemporary approaches really do focus on strengths. It's, it's what Viva was saying. And teams are interdisciplinary and families are treated as partners. Um, and services are, are provided based on the individual child needs. Um, in this region, services are um, often delivered in institutions that have been uh, developed to, um, instead of housing children, um, they are being transformed into early childhood intervention systems. They are also being delivered in multi-service uh, community centers through poly clinics, um, still through re rehabilitation centers, but also through um, home visits and kindergartens. And I would encourage you to speak with um, uh, representative here, the director from Karen Dom Foundation in Bulgaria, where they have some um, excellent work that includes home visiting services and center based services. So early childhood intervention is really about having a team around the child. So you can see in red we have the child and we have a provider. Uh, we call this the primary service provider. That is an early interventionist who might be supported by other um, people from different disciplines, like a physical therapist, a nutritionist, speech language pathologist, and the physical therapist could also be the lead provider. But it's important to have one lead relationship with that family um, and have other people who are supporting that primary provider. And I think more needs to be done to determine what's most cost effective as well. But we know that from research that this is um, preferred by families and um, and so I think it's something to look into, but we can see all of the uh, potential members of the team and it depends on the, the needs of that individual child and family. And I just want to point out too that part of the role as an early interventionist, I'm an early interventionist, if I'm working with a family, it's to identify the other community resources and to make referrals or help the family self-refer to those resources. So it's not just about working with a child with a disability, but it's within the ecological context. And that's absolutely what we would do in the beginning with the family is actually to uh, complete an eco map to identify their strengths and needs as a family. So um, the results were that we had, um, we actually had 392 respondents from 99 nations. Unfortunately, um, some understood early childhood intervention to be early childhood development services. And so we ended up with 81 in the final sample. 55% uh, of countries from Europe were represented, 40% uh, in Asia, 25% um, in Africa and the Americas, and then less in Oceania at just 16%. Uh, so we see 57% of nations said that early childhood intervention is a priority, but that's still not enough. I think a lot more work needs to be done. Um, of course, local municipalities could be um, prioritizing ECI, and um, it's just not at the national level. Uh, we can also see that by income, we do have some low-income countries who are saying that early intervention is a high priority or a moderate priority. And um, I, I won't go into this, but um, I do want to say that early childhood intervention is quite complicated in the sense that you are identifying children who may need uh, 
services through screening. You have to make decisions on what that's going to look like, who's going to do it, what assessments would be appropriate depending on the culture and the context, um, and how do we monitor and evaluate whether our services are working. And these are really complex decisions that take place. I'll just briefly, um, because I am out of time, talk about um, some of the things that people said from the region explicitly, so I'll use my voice as their voice. What has helped you develop early childhood intervention services? Um, EU standards, so parent, um, and also the, um, the, the push to prevent institutionalization, uh, um, parent demand, UNICEF awareness raising on the importance of the early years, demand for evidence-based practice and involvement of universities, um, some of the difficulties are that services are only in urban areas and not reaching the most marginalized, especially those in the rural area. Um, integrated funding is very different, d difficult. There's a lack of evidence-based practice. Um, services are by, is still based on diagnoses only. Um, not receiving services before age six when kids start formal school, and no monitoring and evaluation. So services start, but no one's really checking. And um, and I think you know we have this decentralization, but we have no requirements in terms of what quality is going to look like. There's a severe lack of trained professionals, and there's a need for a coordinating commission and financing studies and models, um, and national guidelines are are not enough. So those are those are their words. Um, just going past these quickly, uh, screening is generally where people start, and I think that's often because sectors pull together around that. Um, so early child intervention, just visually, we, we know that it has to involve health, social protection, and education, and it's really a top-down and bottom-up process with policymakers and practitioners. Um, the pathway, that's just you know, a, a recommendation, um, and it's been um, informed by Emily's great experience developing early intervention services, but I would just like to point out that I think it's really important that you have to develop a shared vision of what services should look like, and that's quite uh, difficult, and the intersectoral collaboration is, is very difficult and time-consuming, and this doesn't happen overnight, but it's absolutely been done. We, can, we have good examples uh, in, in the region, particularly in uh, Georgia. Portugal is also doing amazing work. Um, and so my recommendations would be that um, we really need global, regional, national advocacy campaigns, um, support for policy and strategic planning, uh, national guidelines and standards, but also personnel development um, and standards, and we need comparative uh, financing studies. Um, I just have at the very bottom that um, I, I'm a technical person. I, uh, policy is, an, is not my area of expertise, so I like to work on the ground. And people need just-in-time assistance. When you don't know how to fix something in your house, you probably go to your computer and you Google. Right, I do this. Well, people don't have access to information, and we really need exemplars of what good early childhood intervention practice looks like um, that are culturally and contextually relevant. Um, and we need technical training that's not just one-off, but that has ongoing coaching and mentoring. And we need facilitative support uh, for coordination and collaboration as these strategies uh, and policies are being put in place. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Holly. <coughs> I'm going to ask our speakers to uh, turn to the audience. I'd like to invite our reaction panel oh, sorry, um, to come up. And um, we have a, um, actually quite a large reaction panel today. Do I have enough seats for everybody? There's six people together. OK. Um, so I just want to. Uh, uh, identify them in the order of presentation uh, today. I know that the list here is, is alphabetical, but we thought we should group some of the um, responses together if possible. So first up will be So first up will be Dr. Larry Barisha, uh, former First Lady of Albania and the President of Albanian Children Foundation. Should be followed by Dr. Ariel Como, the Albanian National Coordinator for South European Autism Network. And then Dr. Como will be followed by um, uh, Dr. Lydia uh, 
Dostoyevsky. I hope I got the name right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then uh, and Olivia will be followed by Tatiana Zorsik. Uh, from, both are from Macedonia. And then will be um, uh, Maya uh, Buchkuri uh, from Georgia. And finally, we have Bettina from UNICEF uh, to give us a, a final reaction. So without further ado, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Barisha. Thank you, Andy, for your presentation. Dear friends, it's a pleasure for us to be here in this very important uh, event. Congratulations to organize this event. Professor Iktu Sot, Foundation in FMI Veshqiptar, një organizat që gjesh vjet më par vendosit të punojnë në një fush ku nevoja të ishin vërtet alarmante. Vendosin të punonin me fëmit me të shregullimet të spektrit të autizmit. Today I represent the Albanian Children Foundation, an organization which six years ago decided to work in a field where the needs were of an alarming rate. We decided to work with children on autism spectrum disorder because there was a lack of services, stigma was dominant in society, and the burden heavily weighted to families. Our focus was early assessment and early intervention of such neurodevelopmental disorder as an attempt to reduce the effects on children and their family. Practically, we had to deal with issues of disability as the severity of condition in most cases was hard. The approach in the country was missing. In the past, we had to deal with the therapeutic for the first 14 years and the other 200 regional for autism in the world. We organized the training of these people for the first time that we did not work as a therapist with families that have received autism. In these years, we set up therapeutic services for children up to 14 years old through two regional centers for autism and child development in Albania. We have organized several month trainings for around 100 young professionals that work as therapists with children with autism in Albania and the surrounding countries where Albania live. And one day trainings for over 200 professionals working with children in healthcare or educational services. And for six consecutive years, we organized intensive awareness campaigns with parents becoming the main actors. Around 100 children have been part of our services as a similar number of professionals are involved in activities that we organize. Publikuam shumë materiale për prinder dhe profesionist, përfshire dhe tekse dhe manuale të autore më të shquar ndërkomtar. Bashpunua me pediatr të qëndrave shëndecore për një sistem dhe pistimi dhe finalizuam një instrument trajnimi për prinder si një DVD gjasht orshe që u dheq prindrit si të punoj në hap pas hapi me fëmijët e tyre në shtëpi. We have published several materials for parents and professionals, including texts and manuals of distinguished international authors, cooperated with pediatricians of healthcare centers for a screening system and finalized a training instrument for parents as a six-hour DVD that guides parents how to work step-by-step -step with their child at home. I think our history is generally a success history. Above all, we brought the hope in a poor country with many problems where today a lot is talked about autism. Duhet të ndaj me ju qëfar konsideroj si faktor madhor që ndikuan të kne për këtë sukses? I'd like to share with you what I consider as the major factor that contributed to this success. Së pare, në gjdo hap që bonin verifikonin planet tona me prindrit apo edhe i modifikonin me diskutimet dhe bashkëpunime që kishe me ta. Prindrit ishin dhe janë një generatori dejsh dhe energji, ku ndihen të gjithë të mbështetur dhe të kalojnë gjdo barjer. First, in every step we made, we verified our plans with parents or even modified them through the discussion and cooperation with them. Parents were and are a generator of ideas and energy. When they feel supported, they surpass any barrier. They became the main actors of the fight against stigma or even forms of discrimination toward their children. They have been the main actors in our public awareness campaigns. Së dyti, vendosëm të punojmë për ngritje shërbimesh ku standarti cilësis të ishte sa më njashëm me ato që ndodhë në vëndet e zhvilluara, sepse përndërtojë një model. Kishim nevoj për shumë trajnime, për shumë bashkëpunim, besoj se fjala trajnim për stafin ka qënë 6 vjetë rjeshtë fjala kyqë. 
Second, we decided to work to set up services where the standard of quality would be as similar as those in developed countries because the model was going to be set up. Our needs for training and many corporations were huge. I believe that the word training has been a key word to our staff in six years. The identification of trainers is not an easy job. Also, it's not easy setting up the system of training to achieve the performance. Identifikimi i trajnimeve është një pun jo e let, ndërtimi i strukturës e trajnimeve për të mbritur të performanca nuk është gjithashtu e let, nuk do mundeshim pa Autism Speaks. We would not do it without Autism Speak. We would not do it without the cooperation and expertise of about 10 professionals, mostly Americans ones, that in different periods along the six years have been part of our journey. Së treti, ndërtuam një mekanizm transparent në ngritje shfondesh duke ju drejtuar si aktorve ndërkomtar ashtu edhe biznesit vëndas. Në qëndër të mekanizmit vendosëm historit njërzore të fmive dhe familjeve, biznesin vëndas, eftonim në gjdo aktivitet nga darkat gala të e gvizitat në qëndër për të bërë të diskutushëm dhe të qartë dobin socialet të dhurimit të tyre. Third, we set up a transparent fundraising system addressing to international lectures as well as local businesses. At the center of the system were human stories of children and families. We invited local businesses in every activity from charity boards to visits at the centers to make visible and clear the social usefulness of their donation. Së katërti, ndërtua mardhëni të ngushta me pediatrit, mësuesit, edukatorët e kopshteve, psikologët që punojnë në institucione shëndetsore dhe arsimore, duke u ofruar atyre informacione bashpunime, dijet, trajnime, publikime, cilësore, pjesmarje të vazhdushme. Fourth, we set up close collaboration with pediatricians, teachers, preschool teachers, psychologists, working in healthcare and educational institutions, providing them information and collaboration, knowledge and training, high-quality publications and ongoing participations. Së pesti, ju përkushtuam që në njësje prodhimit të të dhënave dhe studimeve duke konsideruar një komponente e jazakonisht të rëndësishme për vlerësimin e punë nëson dhe për qëndrëshmëri në të artëmen. Historia e këture gjashtë viteve është një histori suksesi, por gjdo dit, që e kalon e bëna të më të qartë që sa të mdhaja në nevoja për të artëmen. Fifth, since the beginning we are dedicated to data and research, considering them extremely important components for the assessment of our work and sustainability in the future. The history of these six years is a success story, but every day that passes makes it clear how huge are the needs. Studimi i sin bi nevojet e fmive me autizm në Shqipri 2014-2015 organizuar me bështetje në Autism Speaks na tregon se një dhe në dy fmi në pes të diagnostikuar me autizm marrin shërbim. Today, children are early diagnosed than before, but services are not sufficient. The caregiver survey of Sean on the needs of children with autism in Albania, organized with the support of Autism Speaks, shows that one to two children of fifth diagnosed with autism receive the service. Children over 14 years old don't have qualified services, while for adults, homes, walls often is the only option. Përshire e fmive me autizm në shkollë e cënë më shumë vështërsi, si kurse dhe rritet presioni i prinderve nda institucionave, apo edhe dashamirësia e profesionalistve dhe edukatorve e mësuzve për ishtimit të ndjeshmëri sociale. Barra mbi familjet vazhdojnë të jetë mjafte madhe. The inclusion of children with autism in school moves forward with great difficulty as parents pressure an institution or the benevolent and professionalism of teachers and educators due to social sensitivity also increases. The burden of families continues to be huge. Shqipria ka nevoj shumë të madhë për shërbimet e sotme, por në rrath të parë ka nevoj për shumë dje, një uri dhe bashkëpunim dërkomtarë. Today, Albania faces the necessity of multiple services, but primarily it needs more knowledge, information and international cooperation. Thank you. Next up is Dr. Ariel Como, the National Coordinator of 
uh, Albania for the South Asian, uh, South Europe uh, Autism Network, and advisors to Ministry of Health. Dr. Como. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I will use this three, four, five minutes just to uh, present a few data on what's going on in a country like Albania. <coughs> uh, I'm a psychiatrist from profession, and uh, uh, one of the things to, to see during uh, searching for uh, proper data and putting them together it is that how difficult it is and how difficult it is even if you go into this kind of reports produced from many organizations on the field. It's also that uh, if you go for a WHO report, then you have a lot of mental health, psychiatry, this kind of semantics. If you go to UNICEF on the, or other agencies, then these kind of words are not mentioned, and then another type of discussion it is there. Uh, when it comes to Albania, it's not more than 3 million inhabitants. And uh, around 20%, or around 600,000, are of age under 14. Uh, a report of the World Bank, Early Childhood Development, the Saber country reports, it's saying that Albania has a well-developed set of laws governing sectorial policy and service delivery for all children. However, an enabling environment specifically for early childhood development is not streamlined. Limited mechanisms are in place to align multi-sector policy making to promote holistic development of children younger than six years old. But then, a 2014 report from UNICEF uh, is giving, it's saying that it's around 18,000, the number of those who are on dis disability sector, let's say, when it comes to under 18. But then the UNICEF report saying or recommends necessity to define a national policy on disability, develop an applicable strategy, obstacles in the early detection of the disability do non-establishment uh, of functional mechanisms for early detection. The assessment of disability, it has to move from the medical, uh, from the medical uh, domain. Number of children with disabilities attending preschool and pre-university education, it is very, very low. Then stigma, discrimination, and violence are present. But then if we go to the uh, WHO reports on mental health, then we see also that Albania, it is the country staying in the low level or with the lowest number of professionals in the field, with the low uh, number of services, with the highest number of institutionalized, and now I'm speaking for mental health. It is with a very reduced number of beds in psychiatric places, but it is pointed out in that report that this just shows the low investment. And the people uh, staying, as it has been mentioned already here, people being institutionalized so high, it is because there are lacking community services. Uh, then in 2011, a WHO study is making the calculation of the very basic needs on possible stuff needed for uh, eight main conditions, including the neurodevelopmental conditions, and it's saying that in a country like Albania, there are needed at least 500 more nurses and psychosocial staff. 500 more at the time the study has been done consider uh, in place there were only 300. 
There are some more additions in the last four years, but compared to the 500 uh, in the medical or let's say in mental health sector, it is too low. <coughs> there has been some important steps in the last years, but maybe just on developing the models. Developing the models, it is a hard issue. It has been this part of the success, having some models on the idea to replicate. This kind of replications in poor countries, it depends a lot on the agenda of influential organizations. And this is important to keep in mind. Multisectorial cooperation comes in countries like Albania or in poor countries after, I believe, but after a cooperation and multisectorial uh, combination of big organizations in our countries. <clears throat> what are the challenges for the future? <clears throat> Upscale of services? Of course. Uh, human resources and capacity building? Yes, a lot. But as it has already been mentioned, guidance and tutorship, it is needed a lot. And this also will have to be part of collaborating maybe countries with each other and countries with big organizations. And then research. When it comes to research, it is so often spoken, but with the resources and the type of capacities, it comes to be a very difficult issue. And this is maybe uh, the main or the, the starting point could be strengthening the information system within the existing care system. Thank you. Thank you, Arkomo. <coughs> Next, we have uh, uh, Tatolia uh, Tochunovska from Macedonia. I just remind all the speakers, we're running a little tight on time, so try to keep within five minutes possible. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, so my presentation is about um, our laws uh, and policy on children with disabilities in um, our country, uh, Republic of Macedonia, in the field of education, social protection, and health care. Uh, because we were uh, told that we have to focus on the policy uh, policies, uh, that's why I will um, just list uh, um, all policies, national, international, that we have, um, and uh, because of the, the due time, I will just pass and not uh, so much uh, talking about them. Um, in Macedonia, we don't have a special law uh, for inclusive education, but the principles of uh, inclusive education is uh, already in um, existing ones, uh, as I said, national and international um, convention or um, strategies. Uh, the law of primary education actually is uh, giving uh, uh, inclusive base uh, to to go further on and to to improve the, um, uh, the to, to improve the condition of uh, pupils with disabilities in the mainstream schools, um, uh, which give the opportunity for the first time uh, since 2008 that the parents can choose um, where to enroll their children in mainstream or in the special schools. Uh, rather than uh, the, the, the prior to this uh, law in 2008, in the, it was written that children with disability uh, can be uh, educated only in the special schools. Then national, national strategy for the development of education, uh, which is 2005-2015, um, and we are about to, to prepare a new one, is actually, actually is giving, um, um, uh, how to say, um, it's a, a giving a focus on uh, uh, reducing the discrimination in the schools and increasing the, the support of children with disabilities in the mainstream schools. Um, national strategy for deinstitutionalization uh, is also focusing on uh, including children with disability in the mainstream schools. Um, the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, not need to speak about it. All of us are aware of its importance. Uh, the national strategy of, uh, on equality and anti-discrimination. 
um, national strategy on equalization of the rights of the people with disabilities 2010-2018 a national strategy of alleviation of poverty and social ex exclusion in the Republic of Macedonia 2010-2020, a law on anti-discrimination, a law on sign language. Uh, so every document actually points out that children with disabilities have the same right to quality education as anyone else. They have the right to choose and have an education in an incl inclusive environment. They're entitled to specific resources and expertise to satisfy their educational needs. As I said, we have a pretty much inclusive national framework regarding the inclusive education for the children. But what is on the ground, as Andy mentioned previously, uh, that we are facing many ch challenges in the practice. Uh, I have to admit that we have limited progress uh, regarding the inclusion of children with disabilities in the schools. We do uh, give them opportunity and ch chances to be enrolled in the regular one, but uh, after that, they don't um, receive enough support that they need. Um, what actually uh, it's lacking that we, uh, we have the, tra the teachers, uh, the schools that don't have enough uh, professional uh, knowledge about how to teach and how to deal with children with various disabilities. Uh, then we have also lots of physical barriers in the schools uh, still prejudice towards these uh, people. Um, as I said, training for the teachers, uh, pre-service and in-service. And I have to mention that with the uh, help uh, of um, UNICEF in Macedonia, we are the last uh, three years actually we are going towards the better um, um, upgrading of the knowledge of uh, uh, teachers in the schools, uh, giving uh, in-service training on the working place. Um, then we don't have enough services in the community, uh, on the community level. Um, um, okay. Uh, then uh, speaking about social protection and health, um, health care, um, at the beginning I have uh, to admit also that we don't have, uh, we cannot say that we have a good um, strategy for early intervention. Uh, for children with disabilities. Um, on the law on social protection and law on child protection, actually they give um, a legal basis for, the, for um, identification of children with disabilities. Also they give opportunity to in, uh, for inclusion in the kindergarten um, and also provides appropriate, also um, actually they, the, they give um, a focus, um, uh, they emphasize the need of the kindergarten to provide better condition and appropriate conditions for children with disabilities. Um, uh, then we have Center for Social Work. Uh, actually, uh, they are doing the evidence of children with disabilities, uh, and also um, uh, they start to uh, to start to implement the measure for social protection. Um, we are still in those countries, as previous, uh, previously Holly mentioned, that we are still in the phase of categorization of disabilities rather than uh, assessment of the needs. Uh, so we do have commission for categorization, uh, whom um, actually we are in the phase of um, uh, changing the, the paradigm. So instead of, as I said, uh, uh, categorization of disability, but to go to assessment of the needs. Uh, we have developmental counseling office. Uh, it's uh, in the primary healthcare facility. Uh, they follow and monitor the um, uh, risky born children zero to six. And also we have parent education. Uh, about the institution for diagnosis and treatment, uh, we have speech therapists, psychologists, physical rehabilitation. Also we do have daycare centers, but also as in the previous research, we have um, on the basis they are open and they are functioning on the, on the basic of, uh, basis of disability and not on the basis of the needs of the children or the people. Uh, target are children uh, 4 to 18, so you see uh, we don't have anything for adults. Uh, about the kindergarten, yes, we have a legal basis for inclusion in the kindergarten, but not, as I, say, in the, as I mentioned, the, the support, individual support for teachers, for parents and for the children. What are the challenges that we are facing? Uh, starting from the identification process, we are um, uh, often late for certain disabilities. And here I will mention children with autism. Um, it is not always followed by support services. And also parents try to avoid whenever possible. Why? Because they will just um, get diagnosis children with autism 
it will be labeling for whole li life long, but in return they will not get any support speaking about home, schools or in the community. Um, diagnostic and treatment process is a still medical approach. Um, categorization of the disabilities rather than the needs of the assessment and limited knowledge about the treatment of certain disabilities. Here again I'm, 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 I will mention about autistic children with autism. Uh, and also underdeveloped um, network of institution, institutions for treatment. Uh, what should be uh, considered in the future is that more financial resources have to be invested in the uh, Actually, in, uh, we have to invest in the family support, uh, which is opposite now in the ground. We invest too much in the institutional care of um, support. Um, then we don't have enough uh, um, support services on the local level of the community and support to the parents. Uh, and kindergarten, they don't have enough um, uh, capacity to enroll children with disabilities. In uh, speaking about the many children in the group, the staff is not educated in enough. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, from the Prime Minister's office next, we have Tatiana Zorzik. Is the coordinator of uh, Shan Network for Macedonia. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. I am Tatiana Zorchets. I'm national coordinator for autism. I come from the Macedonia, from the University Children's Hospital. And in short, I will tell you about our progress so far concerning children with autism. And, uh, and the mention that we have a Sean network uh, in uh, collaboration with Autism Speaks, uh, which, which was established to enhance the living of individuals with autism and other developmental disorders and related mental health conditions in Southeast Europe. Uh, we have a few goals that we try to achieve. It's to raise the public and professional awareness, to collect public health data, to provide training for the professionals, to provide evidence-based services for children and adults and to meet regularly each year so that we can discuss our progress and our future goals. We have uh, members from, uh, nine members from uh, East uh, Europe, which is uh, also Macedonia. We developed a caregiver needs survey. It was uh, intended for primary caregivers of children under the 18 years of age with, uh, with autism and uh, it covers the following domains. Demographic characteristics of the parents and the children, affected child characteristics, services encounters, and parent caregiver perception of their condition. So briefly, uh, I will just say a couple of words of the preliminary results that we have. And uh, I'm talking only about the Macedonian part. What is very uh, important for me is the last uh, paragraph where we uh, describe the language of the children with autism, in which we can see that six, more than 60% of the children with autism are actually nonverbal or minimally verbal, which is uh, something that we have to be very concerned and uh, to focus on, uh, on the treatment uh, uh, mainly. Other stuff is that uh, how the children are receiving, uh, how the parents are receiving information about autism. And of course, the, the highest uh, percentage is from the internet and then from the professional health care, uh, professionals from the health care, which is also something that we, we need to change. Uh, this, is a, this is a slide in which all of the countries were, get, the data from all of the countries was, uh, was gathered. And you can see that uh, autism caused a very distinguished uh, financial problems for the family, which is very true for Macedonia because uh, majority of the, of the family that we in included in this survey uh, said that they had to pay for the services of the professionals privately and not to address to the, to the state uh, uh, facilities or the health system. Also, what we asked was uh, where they face uh, the, the difficulties mainly and what would they like to, to, to change. And of course, 72 percentage of them said that they have difficulties in the healthcare services and that they would like to, to, to see uh, large changes in the health system. Then it's educational possibilities and social care system. 
So the current situation in Macedonia concerning autism is the following. We have uh, rapidly increasing the number of children with autism as anywhere in the, else in the world. And we don't have the registry to know exact numbers of the children with autism, so many people are speculating with the, with the number of children. We still don't have specialized center for autism like Albania has. We have only two daily care centers, so we have uh, the deficit in daily care centers for children with autism. We don't have fully trained professionals for uh, ASD. There are educational barriers, as my colleague mentioned. We still don't have uh, uh, adapted uh, psychometric instruments to um, Macedonian population. And because of all this, we have uh, many parents uh, using alternative medicine for, for their children. And of course, the stigma is always the problem for, for children and families. But uh, we also have some positive aspects, like raised awareness. We always try to, to educate uh, pediatricians, and in every event they have, we always talk about autism for years and years in, in the past. Uh, there is still some uh, inclusion of the children with autism in the special schools or in uh, regular schools. Uh, there is intention to create national strategy uh, by the Ministry of Health. Uh, there is a preparation going on for the national registry by the Ministry of Health. As I said, we have two daily care centers. Uh, there is a plan to open a uh, center for autism for diagnostics and treatments, and we hope that we will uh, have it soon. Uh, what is mainly important for me as a professional, as, as for somebody who is coming from the field, is to or, that we have uh, already one year in, um, in, uh, in education of professionals, mental health professionals, with collaboration with the UCLA, with uh, Professor Connie Kasari, and she's very important for, for our work and for our future. And I can say that, that this is the main achievement in, in the field of autism in the Republic of Macedonia. We have uh, also started preparations to adapt ADOS on Macedonian population, and we are networking um, uh, our country in the in the in the Sean uh, in the Sean network. So uh, the biggest challenge is to create a specially trained team of professionals for autism to open this kind of uh, center and to have a national registry. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, so next, I'd like to have. Uh, uh, Dr. Maya um, uh, She's the SSA Head of Social Program Divisions, uh, guardian, Guardianship and Custody and Social Programs in Department in Ministry of Health in Georgia. Two words about Georgia. We have a population about 4 million children with disabilities. We have 10,000 and orphans children. We have 25,000. Uh, child care reform in Georgia, one of the aims of child care reform in Georgia is closing down children institutions and develop alternative care and family supporting system, services. Number of children in, in the institutions reduce from 5,000 to 200 children. Uh, about ICI model in Georgia, it is interdisciplinary model, and of course it's multi-sector integration and collaboration, and the uh, main... Is it this one? Uh -huh. And the main characters of the reform are Department of Health and the uh, Ministry of Labor, Health and Social Affairs. Here is early detection, surveillance, and referral. Uh, Department of Social Affairs, Ministry of Labor, Health and Social Affairs, early childhood intervention. Uh, with NGO, uh, and this NGO are uh, providers of state programs and transition in preschool institutions and educational services is under the Ministry of Science and Education. During seven years, we are proud of the strong sides of our reform. We can say that now in Georgia, in Tbilisi and regions, uh, services of early inter intervention are developed. 
uh, we have not big budget, but governmental funding system is much more effective. Doctors of doctors of maternity houses and primary health providers are now trained in early detection. Country now has a joint vision on early ch childhood in, uh, development. Uh, we work with international experts, uh, Emily Vargas Baron, uh, thank you um, to Emily for this work, and with <laughs> Georgian uh, Coalition of Early Child Intervention, and we have created ECI Nation Strategy, Action Plan, Policy and Procedure Documents. Regional EIC teams have been trained uh, by international and local experts. Teams are fully equipped and number of children involved on, uh, in ECI program increases every year. You can see this on the chart. This number is provided by social service agency. Uh, here is our budget. It's uh, also it is not big, but um, it is not enough. We cannot cover all needs. And, uh, and um, during uh, the process, we have faced challenges in adoption in ECI national strategy and action plan, launching ECI state program through of Georgia, in development high quality services in ECI management, promoting inclusion of children with special needs by collaboration with Ministry of Education, uh, development or certified university course for ECI specialists in Tbilisi and regions, creating parents and, and powering programs. And of course, closing down Tbilisi infant houses by creating of alternative services for children living there. And here is some statics, statistics about gender, age, and uh, about uh, her families. It is how many children go in the kindergarten and public school uh, edu in educational services. And 2% of all is go to daycare centers, and 50% not involved in any educational institute of social services. Here is diagnosis, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maya. Uh, and, and last but not least, um, Bettina Trotham from UNICEF. Uh, I want to apologize. Um, obviously, I didn't manage the time as, as well as I should have, so we're not going to have uh, time for uh, questions. Uh, because we're going to depend on the next session. But please go to the workshop, uh, the breakout session on, uh, on disability if you're interested. And obviously, there's other opportunities to speak with the speakers. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here and to talk on behalf of the Young Child Wellbeing Team at the UNICEF Regional Office. I apologize, but I'm going to ask you to make some jumps now from the country level back to the regional level and uh, to the focus on, on prevention. Uh, I don't really want to reiterate some of the problems that are faced by children with developmental difficulties in our region, invisibility, late identification, um, uh, institutional care, uh, child-centered uh, services, and so on. Um, but uh, UNICEF is very much trying to address the complex needs of these children um, in uh, four uh, different ways. Uh, one, uh, we are focusing on the use of home visiting services for the prevention, uh, early identification, referral, and support uh, to families of children with special needs. And this is what I will focus most of my time on. Uh, UNICEF is also introducing uh, developmental pediatrics to strengthen family-centered uh, assessment and intervention in the region. Uh, we are promoting social uh, inclusion and learning support in preschool settings, and we are involved in national advocacy for greater social inclusion. Uh, with respect to home visiting services, uh, we are uh, espousing many of the um, concepts and ideas that have been mentioned by Don and Wiebke earlier. Uh, we are promoting uh, comprehensive development of all young children. 
uh, the monitoring and identification of young children at risk of delays and developmental difficulties, uh, support uh, to families in accessing uh, a good quality assessment and intervention services uh, through the health sector and other support services, for example, uh, social benefits. Uh, we are focusing on providing a continuum of care through ongoing case management, such as teaming around the child. Um, we are also trying to help families uh, in the identification of local services at the community level and to advocate for their children. And last but not least, we're trying to empower parents and caregivers to accept uh, these children so they don't end up in institutional care and to promote their development uh, in, in the family. When UNICEF started to support uh, home visiting reform uh, in the region in 2011, um, the home visiting services that were provided to mothers and children were very narrow, uh, medical in nature, included things like uh, disease detection, growth monitoring, nutrition, and so on. And they did not really address the burning issues of inequities, invisibility of young children with developmental difficulties, uh, perinatal mental illness, such as maternal depression, and neglect and abandonment. Uh, in this region, unit, because there were home visiting services available that were reaching out to all, or theoretically reaching out to all families, UNICEF is promoting a universal progressive approach where a comprehensive service is delivered to all families. The content is rich in early child development and prioritizes the prevention of developmental difficulties. For families with special needs, we are then trying to link these families through home visiting with, other, with the services of other sectors and promote the collaboration with sectors such as social services. To strengthen home visitor capacity in the region, we have developed some regional guidance documentation as well as 14 resource modules. Um, these resource modules are uh, very much focusing on early child development. They were developed in partnership with ESA, and um, uh, two of the 14 modules that were developed focus on developmental difficulties. Uh, other modules fo uh, focus on very important content such as attachment, stigma and discrimination, working with other sectors, uh, maltreat child maltreatment, and, and other topics. Uh, last week, we just completed the first training of master trainers. We had 13 countries participate, and actually there are some people who delivered the training, like Kevin Brown and Natalia, and we have also one master trainer here from, Al uh, from Bulgaria who participated in uh, this training in the resource modules. We hope that these modules will then be adapted in these countries and integrated into pre-service and in-service training. Inspired by the regional work, uh, countries have developed their own focus on developmental difficulties and Macedonia is actually a very good example because uh, with the health staff and uh, the nursing association, all of the uh, a program was developed, uh, a training course was developed on developmental difficulties that focuses on knowledge about disabilities, reduction of stigma and discrimination, and better support to families of young children with special needs in their homes and communities. And all patronage nurses, all home visitors are being trained uh, in this course. About half of them have been trained so that there will be more early uh, detection and intervention. Uh, a number of countries are also using the GMCD and are introducing other screening tools. Now just a, a brief few words about the second topic, developmental pediatrics. Uh, UNICEF in 2013-14 conducted a mapping of the available resources of ECI services in our region. Uh, 21 countries were involved. Um, and uh, some of the most important things we noticed is that access to quality early identification and intervention was one of the major problems in the, country, in the countries. So together with the Developmental uh, Pediatrics Department of Ankara University, we have been collaborating to provide an orientation to developmental pediatrics and family-centered services to professionals from 10 countries in our region, and they're receiving ongoing support. 
UNICEF is also co-hosting -host the first International Pediatric Congress in Istanbul, which will take place at the beginning of December, and I hope many of you will attend. Um, and we will be organizing two workshops. One will be focusing on home visiting services as they can help to reduce uh, institutionalization, and this workshop will be conducted by uh, Kevin Brown. And then we have another workshop with a team from Croatia that will focus on uh, teaming around the child approach. Now we have been asked to talk about what are burning research questions. Uh, this is a region where we have only had one assessment of our home visiting services that has taken place in Bosnia and Herzegovina and we have noticed that actually there was some impact on uh, child outcomes or, and uh, parent-child relationships uh, due to home visiting services. However, we need a lot more impact research on these home visiting services that are provided through the Ministry of Health. And we also need research on improve, operational research on improving the quality and content of these services and particularly look at what these services can do to promote the early identification of children with developmental difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Again, my apologies for letting the session run a little longer than intended, but let's uh, give a big round of applause to our speakers and our reaction panel. Please go to the, the breakout session if you're interested or use the uh, everywhere poll to submit your question. Thank you.